As doctors, we're not trained to take care of people. And I mean that literally. When you say to doctors, draw yourself working as a doctor, you'd be amazed at how many pictures have no patients in it. You have diplomas and books and desks in your office. But I was went to a workshop, I think it was with Carl Simonton, when he had written a book about imagery and other things for cancer patients. And I thought, oh, well, this will be for doctors, I'll go. It'll help me help my patients. And I got there, 150 people. I'm the only doctor in the room that blew my mind. Everybody else was a cancer patient. The nice part I realized later was my cancer patients from my office came over and sat next to me. I wasn't making them feel worse or when they're gonna die. And one young lady, when I said to her, well, what brought you here? And she said, you're a nice guy. I feel better when I'm in the office with you, but I can't take you home with me. So I need to know how to live between office visits. That changed my whole approach to medicine because I had my secretary send out letters to all our patients saying, you want to live a longer, better life? Come to a meeting. We'll teach you about survival behavior. That's where I was in a panic because I said to the secretary, you forgot to say it's only for our patients. What if everybody brings two or three friends with cancer? What am I gonna do with hundreds of people? 12 women showed up. See, that taught me something too. That's why our group was called Exceptional Cancer Patients. Because my wife, who was helping me, said, they're exceptional women. I said, all right, let's call them that. Because I didn't have a name for the group. But that's when you begin to learn about survivors. They're willing to show up. They're not afraid of doing it wrong. It isn't just about not dying. Let me enjoy the time I have left. Then you notice they don't die when they're supposed to. I mean, one that'll make you smile, I always have to tell this, is a man who had a few months to live, according to everybody. So he goes out to Colorado to die in the mountains because it's so beautiful. I told the family, call me to the funeral. I'm very close to him, I'll come out there. A year goes by, no phone call. So I call up to say, why do you ignore me? I have feelings too. He answered the phone and he said, it was so beautiful here, I forgot to die. That's when I learned to go up to people I thought were dead and say, how come you didn't die when you were supposed to? I left my troubles to God. Psychiatrists know more of this than oncologists and cardiologists because if you thought, oh, I'm gonna die, I go to see a psychiatrist to help me handle it. And then the psychiatrist noticed, you didn't die when you're supposed to. One wrote an article on an immune competent personality. AIDS patients taught him that because he noticed there's a whole bunch of them that are doing beautifully. So he studied them and he could hand a list out to people of how to behave and how to act and do well. And also it's loving yourself. That's another thing that's such a key. I had one lady, she had polio as a child, so she didn't like her body because she had muscle wasting. Then she developed neurological disease and more is happening. And she said, I got undressed, laid down naked in front of the mirror and started loving my body inch by inch. She said, by that I mean I started on my toes and then worked my way up. Her disease went into remission. Oh, that's one of Siegel's crazy patients. Now that was a compliment. The nurses used to yell at me because my patients refused pain medication. I said, they're not in pain. How can they not be in pain? Because it was what they wanted to do. You see, you have radiation, no side effects. Oh, the machine's broken. I mean, this was a phone call from the radiation therapist. I thought the machine broken. So he said to her, how come you have no reaction to radiation? Oh, I get out of the way and I let it go to my tumor. A lady who was supposed to be dead in two months down in North Carolina, a relative told her to come up here because I make people well all the time. And that upset me for her to promise her neighbor, I mean, her relatives, she had leukemia. I admitted her to the hospital. I called my oncologist friends who now didn't mind working with me because they were having fun too. So they came over and he said, you know, I agree with her doctor. She's got two months to live, but this is his quote. But I know you and your crazy patients, so I'll give her hope. 
In six weeks, she was in complete remission. And what I laughed at, his sense of humor, the chemotherapy, he said, well, have no benefit in her type of cancer. He wrote a note, isn't chemotherapy wonderful? He had to do something. So she thought she was being treated and then she responded completely. I told her to go home and walk down the street and drive her back to crazy that she's not dead and he has to keep saying hello to her. Just kill people with their words. You take hope away. I know one man, and I got the family to sue the insurance company. He had cancer, but he developed cataracts. So his life became meaningless. He can't see a damn thing. The insurance company said, we're not paying for cataracts. You'll be dead in a few months. You're on a waste of money. He literally went into bed the day he got that letter and was dead in five days. And I told the family, sue the insurance company. And they did, because those words killed him. It took his life away. So I've learned, live your authentic life. Now we have a lot of studies. One college student, his professor thought he was nuts, but he's not nuts. He studied actors by giving them comedies and tragedies to act in. And he drew their blood while they were acting. And he showed the difference. If you're in a comedy, immune function has enhanced all the benefits. And if you're in a tragedy, the opposite happens and you're more likely to get sick, have your heart attack, cancer, whatever. Those are things people have to understand. What we're talking about has a lot to do with feelings, but the feelings are science. It's the pain. I cared about people. I became a doctor because I liked people and nobody taught me how to deal with people. It was all about disease. I would say to patients, how come he didn't die when he was supposed to? And I realized that everybody had a story. It could be, I got a door, I changed where I lived, I changed my job. Everybody had a story to tell me. One multimillionaire, he introduced me at a speech down in Miami. I said to him, you dressed like a bum. How could you come like this to, you know, introduce me in front of this crowd? He said, when they tell you you're gonna be dead in a short time, who cares what you wear? I canceled the dress code at work. I told my employees, come in whenever you want. Don't worry about it. And then his wife got him to buy a house on the ocean and listen to meditation tapes. And he lived for over five years when he was supposed to be dead in a couple of months. And he really changed his hospital because they knew damn well it was him, not anything they, we're doing. How do you describe through one word what it's like to have cancer? What would you say you're going through? Lady said to me, failure. I said, well, what in your life fits failure? She said, well, my cancer, my body's there. I said, that's not my question. Oh, my parents committed suicide when I was a child. I must have been a failure as a child. She went home with a different outlook or somebody uses the word pressure, then they realize what's going on in their life that's causing pressure. It ain't the disease, it's your life. I was running support groups every week. I worked with people, meditation, changing lives, all those things. And you know what's interesting? Men do have a poorer survival rate than women with cancer because men are into, oh, I can't work anymore. What's the point of living? I've had men say that when their wife and children are sitting in the room. There's no point in living, I can't work. And then there was one lady who was such a classic. I have nine children, I can't die till I'm all married and out of the house. 20 years later, I got a call. My ninth child had left home. I couldn't believe she was still alive 20 years later. The cancer came back. That's what, as a doctor, broke my mind. How the hell do you control cancer for 20 years and then it comes back? Women with the same cancers as men do live longer. Though most doctors say, oh, it must be their hormones, it must this, it must that. No, it's their attitude towards life. 